According to the latest reports, SpaceX may have to wait longer for the Starship second integrated flight test. The Federal Aviation Administration announced on September 8 that it had closed its mishap investigation into the April 20 launch, identified multiple root causes for the aborted flight, and would require SpaceX to perform 63 correction actions to prevent similar mishaps in the future. Later, CEO Elon Musk released the list of 63 corrective actions taken, which were then submitted to the FAA for approval. The corrective measures included several major and minor upgrades to the Starship and booster engines, redesign of the launch pad and launch mount, flight termination system modifications, the installation of the hot stage ring, and a thousand other changes. On September 18, Kelvin Coleman, FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, told Space News that the agency is working well with SpaceX to ensure that the company has implemented all the corrective actions from the mishap investigation. In an official statement to NASA spaceflight, the FAA said it should be finished with the safety review for SpaceX's application for the Starship launch license by the end of October. As part of that license application determination process, the FAA will review new environmental information, including changes related to the launch pad, as well as other proposed vehicle and flight modifications mentioned earlier. Moreover, when and if SpaceX gets its launch license depends partly on how fast the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducts a review of the environmental impact of the latest upgrades to the Starbase launch site. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the April Starship launch scattered large chunks of concrete and metal over 385 acres of SpaceX and Boca Chica State Park land, and a fire was also reported on 3.5 acres of State Park land. In addition to the steel and concrete that were spread over the launch site, a huge cloud of pulverized launch pad drifted with the wind and covered Port Isabel, 6.5 miles northwest of Boca Chica. The FAA submitted a draft update of the biological assessment to U.S. Fish and Wildlife in August, requesting consultation under the Endangered Species Act. Bloomberg reports that the consultation won't resume until the Fish and Wildlife Service reviews the FAA's final biological assessment and deems it complete. The agency will then have up to 135 days to produce its own biological assessment. The procedure can take even longer if they determine that additional information is required. One of the biggest upgrades at the launch site that the agency will be looking into is the new water deluge system, designed to discharge massive amounts of water onto the launch pad at liftoff to dampen the tremendous impact of 33 Super Heavy Raptor engines. Although FAA officials have expressed optimism that the agency's safety review of the license application will be done by the end of October, the agency cannot give SpaceX a new launch license until the consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service is complete. With just a little over 100 days left in 2023, there's a good chance Starship won't launch again until next year, depending on how long the Fish and Wildlife Service environmental review takes. Musk reacted by posting on X that it is unacceptable and added that it is absurd that SpaceX can build Starship faster than government agencies can shuffle paperwork. Meanwhile, owing to the license delay, at Starbase, teams recently de-stacked Starship 25 and Super Heavy Booster 9. After receiving the launch license from the FAA, SpaceX will install the flight termination system on the ship and the booster and stack them for launch. The hot staging ring was removed from Booster 9 on Thursday, September 21, for reasons unknown. The ring might require some minor fixes before the next full stack. The exact reason will become clear in the coming days. SpaceX recently posted on its website that the primary cause of the April 20 anomaly was a propellant leak at the aft end of Super Heavy Booster 7, which resulted in a fire and damaged critical hardware of the launch vehicle. Booster 7 had a system to purge the engine bay with an inert gas before and during flight, expelling any gases that could possibly cause a fire to start. However, that system failed to prevent the fire adequately. The Ring Watchers team recently published an article outlining the booster's leak mitigation techniques that SpaceX put in place to avoid a similar mishap in the future. Let's discuss those design changes with the help of this article. On Booster 7, SpaceX had pressurized storage tanks filled with carbon dioxide to purge the booster's engine compartment of any leak fuel. The tanks were placed inside two of the four booster chines. The purging system for Booster 7 was good in theory, but it became evident following the first integrated flight test that it would need to be far more powerful in order to evacuate any hazardous gases quickly. So, SpaceX upgraded the system for Booster 9. They installed significantly larger CO2 tanks under each chine increasing the system's capacity by almost 15 times that of Booster 7. Additionally, there are 18 new vents around the aft end of the booster, placed towards the top of the engine compartment. Given the significant increase in CO2 capacity, it appears that the vents are used to allow the constant flow of gases to be evacuated. 
The updated system has been tested several times during Booster 9 pre-launch tests. If you look closely at the vents just before the ignition of Booster 9's engines during a static fire, you can see them begin venting and immediately get sucked under the launch mount. Let's hope the system will flood the engine bay with enough carbon dioxide to prevent a fire during the next mission. Apart from the new CO2 purging system, SpaceX has also replaced several seals within valves, manifolds, and flanges, and added more torque to bolts to reduce the leaking of propellant. Engineers also added stronger shielding around each of the booster's 33 Raptor engines to protect them from explosions from nearby engines, a measure intended to reduce the chance of cascading failures. Booster 9 incorporates many more design upgrades compared to Booster 7. Please check out my previous video to learn about those design changes. Link in the description. SpaceX teams have been working to install the third and final large deluge system water storage tank for the past several weeks. In these latest images provided by RGV Aerial Photography, it can be seen that the tank has been fully installed, and teams are currently in the process of connecting all necessary valves and other systems to the tank. After the ongoing work is finished, we might witness at least one test of the deluge system operating at its maximum capacity. Several water tanks have been spotted arriving at the launch site lately to fill the deluge system tanks for the upcoming tests. Super Heavy Booster 10 has recently completed three cryogenic proof tests at the Massey's test site. The test on September 13 saw the methane tank of Booster 10 completely filled with supercooled liquid nitrogen. It was the second cryo-proof test of Booster 10 after the first test in July. On September 15, Booster 10 performed its third cryo-test, which involved partially loading liquid nitrogen into the oxygen tank before detanking. The next round of tests happened on September 17. The oxygen tank of the booster was first filled completely in around two hours. The booster was held in that state for the next one and a half hours, and several vents were observed from the oxygen tank. The oxygen tank was then drained as liquid nitrogen was gradually pumped into the methane tank. Both tanks were completely drained a few hours later, concluding the test. The recent Booster 10 tests were performed to evaluate the minor design upgrades SpaceX has made to the vehicle since its first cryo-proof test in July. Booster 10 was moved back to the build site on September 19 and sent to the Mega Bay. The booster was later lifted and placed on the engine installation stand. Booster 10 static fire tests on the orbital launch mount will likely begin after the second integrated flight test. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Stoke Space, a U.S. startup company founded in 2019 by former Blue Origin and SpaceX employees Andy Lapsov and Tom Feldman, is working on a fully reusable launch vehicle where both the booster and upper stage are recovered and reused. The company started by developing a fully reusable second stage, designed to return from orbit and land vertically at a precise location. On September 17, a Stoke Space second stage prototype, called Hopper 2 measuring 4 meters in diameter and standing 6 meters tall, executed a 15-second test flight, during which the vehicle flew to a height of around 9 meters and vertically landed 4.5 meters away from the launch pad. According to Stoke Space, the hop test of the second stage prototype was a crucial assessment of the vehicle's avionics, software, and ground systems. The test successfully demonstrated the performance of the company's oxygen hydrogen engine, which is based on a ring of 30 thrusters around the circumference of the vehicle. The test also verified the vehicle's regeneratively cooled heat shield performance and the ability to throttle the engine and its thrust vector control system. Although Hopper 2 didn't directly experience the heat from hypersonic atmospheric re-entry during the hop test, Stokes said it has successfully operated at 100% of the expected heat load in a simulated environment. The concept behind Stoke Space's fully reusable launch system has been compared to SpaceX's Starship launch vehicle. The Hopper flight test is comparable to SpaceX's Star Hopper tests conducted at Starbase in 2019. The Hopper 2 vehicle had a 20-second static fire test on September 12 before the hop test. And that test came after work done in March with an earlier prototype, Hopper 1, to test the fluid systems, propellant conditioning, operational procedures, and terminal count. According to Stoke Space, the Hopper program was geared to develop the reusable second stage system and verify a lot of the new and novel technology elements that go into it. The company said that they have achieved all of their technical milestones with the upper stage, and they will now focus on developing the rocket's first stage. The company is already building and conducting component-level testing of the first stage and its engines inside its factory in Seattle. They expect to complete the development of a full-fledged orbital launch vehicle by 2025. Please check out my dedicated Stoke Space video to learn more about the company and its goals. Link in the description.
The Rocket Lab Electron rocket recently suffered an in-flight anomaly, losing a radar Earth observation satellite. The mission, dubbed We Will Never Desert You, launched on Tuesday, September 19, from Rocket Lab's New Zealand facility, was carrying a synthetic aperture radar spacecraft for the California company Capella Space. It was Rocket Lab's third mission for Capella in 2023, and the second launch in a multi-launch contract of four missions, which will deploy Capella's new Acadia satellites into low Earth orbit. Stage separation happened as planned about two and a half minutes after launch, but something went wrong shortly after that. A brief glow was seen when the rocket's upper stage single Rutherford engine ignited, followed by orange sparks. And then the video from the rocket's onboard cameras froze. The rocket's telemetry data showed the velocity of the rocket's upper stage decreasing, suggesting the upper stage engine was not generating any significant thrust. The engine may have suffered an ignition failure or a premature shutdown. Without enough speed to reach orbit, the upper stage and its payload plummeted into the Pacific Ocean downrange of Rocket Lab's launch site. It was the fourth failure for the Electron rocket in 41 flights, and the first since May 2021. All four failures occurred after the first stage separation during the second stage's flight. Rocket Lab has already begun investigating the anomaly in conjunction with the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration. The next Electron launch, for Japanese company IQPS, which was to occur later this month, would be postponed to allow for any corrective actions that might be needed. NASA has released video from a solid rocket motor hot fire test that took place on September 14 at its Marshall Space Flight Center. The solid rocket motor tested was a 24-inch subscale version of NASA's Space Launch System rocket booster. The test was part of an ongoing series of developmental tests for an upgraded booster design for future configurations of the SLS rocket. Beginning with Artemis 9, the SLS rocket in its Block 2 configuration will use the Booster Obsolescence and Life Extension Booster, also known as BOL. The test conducted on September 14 was the third in the series to evaluate the alternate materials for possible use in the nozzle and motor insulation. The subscale motor tests are essential to learning how a full-scale BOL booster will perform during flight. Each of the current generation SLS boosters produces 16 mega newtons of thrust during liftoff, which is more than 75% of the total thrust generated by the rocket for the first two minutes of flight. The more powerful next generation bolt booster will allow the SLS rocket to send even heavier payloads to the moon and other areas of deep space for future Artemis missions. SpaceX pushed the boundaries of first stage reusability with the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. The Falcon 9 lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on September 19, carrying 22 Starlink Internet satellites toward low Earth orbit. It was SpaceX's 65th orbital mission of the year, the company's previous mark, 61, was set in 2022. After stage separation, the rocket's first stage came back to Earth and landed on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, becoming the first booster to fly and land for a record-breaking 17 times. Meanwhile, the upper stage continued its journey and eventually deployed the 22 Starlink satellites into orbit. To date, SpaceX has lofted a total of 5,135 Starlink satellites into orbit, out of which 4,764 are still in orbit. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.